The binding problem in cognitive neuroscience is an endeavor to comprehend how elements like objects, emotional or abstract features, and backgrounds are incorporated into a single experience. Known as a problem, because no comprehensive model exists yet, it involves our brain system of encoding the mix of perceptions, decisions, and actions. We encounter daily four subcategories exist within the binding problem, encompassing them in neuroscience, cognitive science, and philosophy of mind. They include coordination considerations, the subjective unity of perception, variable, binding, and temporal synchrony, the last one. Temporal synchrony is related to how our attention assists in binding phenomena together. In simple terms, the binding problem asks why different aspects of a perception processed by different parts of our brain come together to form a unified whole. A well-known theory, binding by synchrony, BIPS, suggested that the synchronizing activity of different neurons in the cortex contributes to the binding segregation of individual object features. When a stimulus is presented, the neurons located in various areas of the brain are said to synchronize transiently, supporting the recognition of shapes and features of those objects. Empirical evidence supporting this theory emerged when von der Malsberg proposed that feature binding creates a unique problem that can't be wholly explained by cellular firing rates. However, new evidence suggests that this isn't as big an issue as initially thought since modules apparently code for several features at once, resolving part of the feature binding issue. Studies have indicated a connection between rhythmic synchronous firing and feature binding, with this type of firing seemingly tied to intrinsic oscillations in neuronal somatic potentials. While there's extensive proof for synchronization of neural firing in response to visual stimuli, it's met with inconsistencies between laboratory findings and criticisms from several recent reviewers, calling the theory into question. For example, Thiel and Stoner found that perceptual binding of two moving patterns didn't impact the synchrony of the neurons responding to those patterns in the primary visual cortex, Dong et al. discovered that neural synchrony didn't depend on whether the neurons were responding to contours of the same or different shapes, suggesting synchrony is independent of binding condition. Goldfarb and Treisman have suggested a potential issue when it comes to solely binding objects through synchrony if these objects only share some features and not all of them. They present the argument that synchrony may only help segregation if it's supported by other means, an idea also acknowledged by von der Malsberg. Research in neuropsychology further shows that the process of associating color, shape, and movement as characteristics of an object isn't as simple as linking or binding inefficiencies have been noted when failing to bind these elements into groups for association purposes. Such research provides ample evidence that top-down feedback signals allow for sensory data to be treated as features of early processed objects, often incorrectly foreseen. Pili Shin highlights how the brain preconceives objects which are allocated features, granting them ongoing existence whilst exploring the way visual integration amplifies over time. The problem of visual feature binding pertains to how we avoid mixing up a red circle with a blue square and a blue square in a blue circle. With a red square, the understanding of which brain circuits play a role in visual feature binding is expanding. The binding process is crucial to correctly encode varying visual features within distinctive cortical areas. Treisman, in her feature integration theory, suggested that the first forms of feature binding are facilitated by the features linking to a common location. The secondary stage encompasses uniting individual features of an object which necessitates attention. The selection of this object transpires within a comprehensive map of locations. Support for her theory comes from experiments showing binding failures under conditions of full attention, indicating that binding is accomplished via common location tags. These theories infer that sensory data such as color or motion normally don't exist in an unallocated state. For Merker, this means that elements like the red in a red ball won't exist in an abstract color space. Signals in the brain with propositional content or meaning represent a broader issue. Marr and Barlow propose that the final melding of these features into a percept would likely resemble sentence syntax based on what was known about neural connectivity in the 1970s. This suggests that our understanding of sensory data may be much more complex than initial theories proposed. Study of visual feature binding emphasizes the role of spatial attention in binding integration. Particularly, it underscores the importance of object location as a prime cue for integration. The role of the parietal cortex in spatial attention becomes apparent through functional MRI scans, 
Especially noteworthy is the activation of the parietal cortex during tasks that simultaneously display multiple objects in various locations. Quite the contrary, the cortex was considerably less engaged when these objects were showcased sequentially at one location. The investigation by Defalzi et al. adds another dimension to this exploration, diving deep into the understanding of feature binding by focusing on two feature dimensions, color and motion. By defining bound conditions as relevant features of the same object and unbound as features from different objects, the study presents a clear distinction. Observations drawn from local field potentials recorded from the monkey's lateral prefrontal cortex unveiled a neural representation of visual feature binding within 4 to 12 Hz frequency bands. This is seen as evidence indicating transmission of binding information across different neural subpopulations within the lateral prefrontal cortex. Further, this study presents visual feature binding as the product of two distinct mechanisms at work in visual perception. The integration of distinct features over multiple temporal windows and attentional support from familiar objects. This observational data also indicates a link between binding information and the subject's reaction time. Finally, the passage touches upon the deliberation of philosophers like Descartes, Leibniz, Kant, and James on the consciousness. Related binding hinting at the bigger unity of a phenomenal experience. It questions how our cognitive mechanisms truly construct phenomenal objects. Hinting at a deeper narrative, the unity of experiencing diverse features like reading a book, hearing a song, or feeling an emotion. Theories hint at our global awareness of an interconnected whole being linked to higher order visual fields. Furthermore, segmenting and organizing a perceptual scene seems to be the role of the posterior parietal cortex. Interestingly, when bodies face each other, they're processed as a single entity suggesting a human brain bias towards grouping in couples or dyads. Furthermore, early philosophers such as Descartes and Leibniz contemplated the unity of our experiences. They noted this concept is an all-or-none quality, unlinked to known quantitative attributes like proximity or cohesion. Taking this a step further, 19th century scholar William James instituted the phrase combination problem to define the incompatibility between the unity of consciousness and physics. He introduced a concept called co-consciousness, challenging the mind, thus theory that equates human consciousness to atoms forming matter. Unlike this theory, which fails to explain how smaller experiences combine to form a unified experience, co-consciousness suggests a single experience comprised of multiple elements. Whitehead proposed a foundation based on this concept, framing an idea of causal elements coexisting in one unified experience. The details of convergence and segregation in these causal relations are complex. And while signal convergence sites throughout the brain do exist, there is a need to avoid recreating the idea of a single central convergence point, or a Cartesian theater, as Dennett refers to it, based on Descartes' proposal. Stoll and his team used an fMRI experiment to determine how people perceive a changing but stable stimulus, whether they view it as a whole or in parts. The experiment exhibited that lower levels of the visual cortex were subdued when subjects viewed the stimulus as a global entity without shape grouping. Global screenings caused a subdued higher cortical activity. This points towards the idea that the upper order cortex plays a crucial part in perceptual groupings. Grassi and his colleagues, on the other hand, applied three different kinds of motion stimuli to delve into scene partitioning, the process of how meaningful units are clustered and separated from others within a scene. Throughout all stimuli, scene division correlated with increased activity in the posterior parietal cortex and reduced activity in lower visual sectors, hinting at the significance of the posterior parietal cortex in viewing a consolidated entity. As for Mursat and his team, they utilized an each frequency tagging method to distinguish the brain activity corresponding to the perception of the entire object as opposed to its part. The experiment yielded results indicating that the visual system perceives two close humans as a facet of a consolidated entity. These findings align with the evolutionary proposition that face facing bodies represent one of the earliest forms of social interaction, while also corroborating other experiments' findings regarding body, selective visual sectors reacting more explosively to bodies facing each other. Examinations have revealed that ferritin and neuromelanin present in the human substantia nigra pars compacta, synced tissue can facilitate wide electron tunneling. 
Further tests disclose that ferritin structures resembling ones in sense tissue have the potential to transmit electrons over 80 microns and can follow the column blockade theory to fulfill switching roles. Both findings coincide with predictions, part of a hypothesis considering ferritin and neuromelanin can provide a binding mechanism associated with action selection. This hypothesis has yet to be directly investigated, but it and the notice patterns have been applied to integrated information theory. Philosopher Dennett postulated that our belief that our experiences occur as singular events is merely an illusion. He suggests that we have multiple drafts of sensory patterns at various sites during any moment. Each would cover only a part of we believe we experience essentially. His argument is that consciousness is not unified, and there isn't a phenomenal buying problem. Though this idea has been met with skepticism amongst philosophers, C. Bain, some physiologists find agreement in it. In an exploration of consciousness studies, Lama criticizes the argument that rich mental experiences are an illusion, emphasizing that conscious content cannot be matched with cognitive accessibility. Challenging Dennett's dissociation of thoughts from biophysical events, Edwards and Sivush use biophysical terms to explain their theory of various causal convergent sites. Their model proposes full sensory signals at each site, which are then unified within individual neuronal trees. The concept has merits and demerits. It explains the neuroanatomical convergent site, but fails to rationalize the concept of multiple experiential copies. The complexity of an experiential event remains largely unresolved in this discussion. To understand phenomenal experiences' elaborate nature, many theories agree on the idea of a singular, not multiple, experiential copy. These theories usually resort to functional illuminations of distributed networks of cells. Bars, for instance, suggests signals we experience are sent into a global workspace and then broadcast to cortical sites for simultaneous processing. Dehane, Shane Zhu, Tononi, and others have presented nuanced interpretations of this workspace model, revolving around reciprocal versus feed, forward signaling, or meta. Representation these theories, although not specifying how consciousness is unified, describe functional domains contributing to unified conscious experiences. Roskenberg presents a problem with these functional domains, the challenge of defining what is included or excluded. Despite this, many agree with this network-based approach. The correlation between computational and phenomenal synchronization is also explored, with Crick, von der Malsberg, and the Singer group expressing an interest in synchrony as a solution for both problems. However, Merker warns of the contradiction in presuming a computational solution for the unity of perception avoiding a local biophysical domain within the context of synchrony. The crux of the referenced models suggests an underlying similarity between computational and phenomenal events. Still, the precise nature of this similarity remains elusive. According to Merker's analysis, there are two plausible assumptions. Either the computational and phenomenal aspects of binding are shaped by the converging signals on neuronal dendritic trees or our notion that both computational and phenomenal circumstances require binding to work cohesively is misguided, we may be pursuing the idea of a superfluous concept. Merker insists that the identical connectivity of sensory pathways can carry out the required task. In the realm of modern connectionism, cognitive neuroarchitectures such as oscillatory networks, integrative connectionist symbolic ex-cognitive architecture, holographic reduced representations, ours, and Neural Engineering Framework, NEF, resolve the binding problem via integrative synchronization mechanisms. This includes the phase, synced binding, by synchrony Beebs mechanism. This mechanism enables perceptual cognition or low-level cognition. The neurocognitive process of binding together different attributes like shape, contour, texture, color, and direction of motion of a perceived object or event into a unified mental representation or a gestalt in line with gestalt psychology. Furthermore, it also aids in language cognition or high-level cognition, the neurocognitive process that yields linguistic constructs by dynamically connecting semantic concepts with syntactic roles. This dexterity allows the generation of systematic compositional symbol structures and propositions, which are then comprehended as intricate mental representations.